think about here too is with the lipoic acid, what forms are you using? Your R-stabilized forms are going to have a higher um, efficacy than your uh, racemic ratios where they're mixed R and L. Uh, niacin, 50 milligrams there. You can play around with that too. I mean, if you're an advocate of using niacin for uh, lipid modulation, um, in this scenario, I'm not a fan of doing that because you run the risk of increasing triglycerides. So I'm not a fan of doing that for this scenario. Your zinc, 30 milligrams, you can go above there too. Um, but that, that should get it done, especially if you're looking at it in a synergistic manner. And then your, uh, you can see the doses on magnesium and biotin. Those biotin dosages, if you guys look at this, those are probably going to look high to you for what you typically see in like a multi or um, in just your standard uh, B complex, something like that. These are therapeutic dosages for insulin resistance. This is where the literature goes with, the, with biotin for this. So. And then your vitamin D. Five to 10,000, there's all kinds of schools of thought on this. I typically start at about 10,000. Let me, let me pass along something to you on this though. And this is in watching the serum levels, not just watching the intracellular values. If you've got someone who has the classic metabolic picture, right? They're, they're a little bit of a heavier individual, have more adipose tissue, more fat tissue. You may have to go above this 10,000 to get results with them to keep driving their vitamin D up. The other thing to consider is if you, ch even if it's someone who is not, that doesn't have that anthropometric presentation, watch for what their, um, if you can't get the vitamin D up, consider checking their vitamin D receptors. They may have a genetic variant in their vitamin D receptors that causes you to have to push higher amounts of vitamin D also with them. And then the paleo diet for, for these individuals. And if you guys don't have information on the paleo diet, go to my clinic website. You can, you can have it all. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, use it, whatever you need to do to get results with your patient. Um, some of these ideal lab ranges, these are some of the things that I look at. So if someone comes into me and they've got a, an insulin of 15, my comment to them is, okay, you've got this insulin of 15, my first goal with you, so we're staging our goals, my first goal with you is to get you under 10. Once we've got you under 10, then it's time to get you under 4. All right. And here's what I see with patients. You know, some patients you talk to them sometimes and you make dietary recommendations and exercise recommendations and they only get on one or the other <coughs> with you. Yes. These are the people that you can't get under four. I can get them to six, seven, but they won't go under four. The classic ones and the ones I see more often are the ones that do the diet part but don't want to commit to the exercise. If they don't have increased res or if they don't have uh, uh, routine resistance training as part of their program, part of their weekly program, they're not going to get increased sensitivity of those insulin receptors. Bar none resistance training is one of the best ways to increase the activity of those insulin receptors. Right. So just in case you guys see that, just know that that's what you're looking at. And then on the glucose side, so Standard glucose, if you look at, say, LabCorp Quest, those guys are going to run ranges of about 65 to 99. Now, I don't know about you, but I know if somebody walks in my clinic and they're at a 65 on their blood glucose, they're probably not going to be the best person to try to interact with at that time, right? <laughs> they're going to be pretty ear, right? That is a, that is a blatant hypoglycemic case. Most of the patients that we're going to see on the low side tend to be more reactive hypoglycemia. Reactive hypoglycemia is a symptomatic diagnosis. It's not necessarily a lab-based diagnosis. Okay? Mm -hmm. So just go back to the, uh, the slide that I gave you with the symptoms that someone with hypoglycemia would present with. Mm -hmm. That's going to be what you want to use as your criteria for beginning to work with this. In looking at these, I think if you get someone about 85 to 90, that's going to be your best ranges. If somebody sit, is sitting with that with the fasting blood glucose, they're doing pretty good on managing their glucose levels. But again, glucose is the least efficient marker to look at for determining what the overall status of someone's glucose regulation is. Your body will do just about everything it can and it will disrupt numerous things around glucose to try to keep glucose stable. Use insulin as your example. Your body will keep pushing up insulin to keep glucose levels down. What happened if you took that insulin away and it wasn't there to regulate that glucose? It skyrocket, right? Mm -hmm. So the body uses all these other biomarkers to try to control what the activity of your glucose is. 
Um, two other ones that I should have put in here are LDH. If you're LDH, lactate dehydrogenase, not LDL, LDH. If your LDH is less than 140, that's another indication for reactive hypoglycemia. And if the triglycerides are over 100, the standard ranges on that is over 150. Use over 100 for your range there. What's LDH stand for? Lactate dehydrogenase. It's an enzyme that's in the cells, and if you're not getting energy production, you're not going to make it, so you'll see those levels start to fall. What level are you three LDH? One, less, one, than less than 140. So all that information is great, right? But you got to put it into practical terms to be able to interact with our patients. So let's go through some case studies here. So here's the first one. 25-year-old female, 5'2", uh, 161 pounds, 37% body fat, 44.5 total body water. So how many of you guys are checking total body water? Okay, so total body water, what this indicates is that when they're between 50 and 55%, you're looking at adequate maintenance of lean muscle tissue. Once they start getting below that, they probably don't have enough lean muscle tissue. In a scenario like what we've been talking about with our typical patient presentation, you know, looking at what we just talked about with the resistance exercise, we would anticipate that someone who's doing resistance exercise, has lean muscle tissue, is probably not going to have an issue with dysglycemia, at least not on the hyper, uh, hyperglycemia side. So we're already starting to see some problems in just our initial assessment here. In talking to her, chief complaint of muscle aches and severe unrelenting fatigue, this lady would actually have to um, go home from work. Um, ended up having to write her a doctor's note saying that, look, we, we're working on this stuff, so you know, just bear with your employee here. Tired after eating, especially after lunch, right? So she's tired immediately after eating and, and after lunch. And look at what times works. 3 p.m., so that in between meal time. Uh, still hungry after eating sometimes. Breast tenderness just prior to mincy, so we're already thinking there's some hormonal dysfunction occurring here, secondary to this. And look at this, she is 25 and her memory is getting worse as of late. Wow. Ask people about this. They don't have to be in their 50s and 60s, right? This girl is young. <clears throat> oh, before I go forward with this, how bad is her micronutrient test going to look? Mm -hmm. Bad, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, not really. Mm -hmm. No. This is the point I want you guys to see. You, If you're only waiting for that glucose of 126, I keep saying that, that's your standard marker, or if you're only waiting for that uh, glucose insulin interaction or the chromium or the fructose sensitivity to pop up, you're letting people slide. Don't do it. De remember, predictive. If you don't address it now, they will come back with that glucose insulin interaction. They will come back with the chromium deficiency, the uh, decrease in their spectrox, concluding they have an increase in inflammation. These things will come back. But here's what she did have. She did have a B12 deficiency. She did have zinc. Zinc is needed for synthesis, storage, and release of insulin, mm -hmm. right? And she did have the chromium. So chromium is kind of the, you got something here, right? Mm -hmm. But the zinc, even if you didn't have that, so even if Spectre Cell decided not to report those borderlines to us, we know with that zinc, we got to be clued in on this one. Mm -hmm. So here's what some of our other labs showed. If you look at her insulin, remember what I told you earlier about insulin? Under 10, under 4. She's still over 4. Right? She's under 10, but she's still under 4. Okay. And then her omega-3 status, you can see her omega-3 status is lower than what it should be too. I, I left out that entire section on omega-3s for this presentation. We could sit here and have another hour, two hour long conversation on just the effects of omega-3s and how they help with metabolic maintenance. So just know that that's a pretty strong indicator as well. And what would you typically think about with a patient that has metabolic syndrome from an endocrine perspective, right? Probably higher estrogen, lower testosterone, more catabolic, less anabolic, right? So do we have that? Yes, we have a high estradiol. Do we have decreased anabolism? Yes, look at where her testosterone is at. She has low testosterone. So now we're starting to see some of the clinical picture of why she can't put on that lean muscle tissue. What's playing into that? 
So here's what I did with her. I put her on a metabolic support formula, and that, that metabolic support formula is, it's gonna be metabolic synergies that we're not using, right? And again, you guys that talk to me on a routine basis, you probably get tired of hearing me say metabolic synergy. It flat works is the reason I use it, and you can see why now it works, right? But in her case, we had the zinc, we had some of the, we had the chromium, we had these other nutrients in there. So just strictly from the standpoint of patient compliance and not wanting to give the patient a cumbersome treatment schedule, I'm trying to package as many things into one product as I can to improve the follow through on this. Right? So that's the reason I start here. You saw she had the B12 deficiency. Um, that's the, uh, to improve her homocysteine and bring her B12, deficient B12 stats up. The omega-3s and the vitamin D, and you'll see I put in here too, the CIRMs, those selective estrogen receptor modifiers. I wanted to try to manipulate that estrogen uh, activity as much as I could to help give her some symptomatic relief. And then paleo diet. Case two, 57 year old female, 5'3", 165, weight loss, resistance, and fatigue. So primarily what she's, she's concerned about. Family history of breast cancer, former smoker, MVA with severe brain injury, right? So she's even more prone to the effects of what the dysglycemic states are gonna, gonna do. Um, feels no difference after eating, diet is high in carbohydrates, sedentary, high stress, I mean, you, you can see the pattern here, right? So here's what the labs show. Look at our HbA1c. Standard clinical definitions now, she's already running into a hyperglycemic scenario based off of the HbA1c. So she's at a 5A, row her 5.7. Mm -hmm. Look at the vitamin D, 31 here. Mm -hmm. We want to see these up above 60. Mm -hmm. So she's about half of where she needs to be with this. Um, and then the white blood cell count, or not the white blood cell count, the uh, red blood cell markers, her MCV is over 92. And you, you'll see the relevance of that as it relates to the B12. Uh, looking at her labs, okay, this is going to be your classic scenario here. More, you know, more along the lines of what you would anticipate. She's got the insulin, she's got the chromium, we, we know automatically that she's got impaired glucose tolerance factor activity. Um, we're seeing the calcium and the magnesium. We talked about the effects of magnesium on the telomerase enzyme, maintaining the length of those telomeres to improve uh, beta cell signaling, beta cell activity. And then calcium. Well, how does calcium play into that scenario? Well, again, vitamin D, right? Mm -hmm. If you're seeing the calcium deficiency, the only time that I start adding in any reasonable amounts of calcium on top of vitamin D when I see it low like this is if I've got an osseous presentation, osteopenia, osteoporosis, you know, something like that that I need to be thinking, eh, this person could probably benefit from a little bit more calcium along with their D. Otherwise, we're going with straight D in this process. And she did have more of a more of your traditional metabolic type presentation. Um, but again, guys, look at what these insulin levels are. These insulin levels aren't skyrocketing insulin levels. She's still down under 10, but she's not under 4. Your best levels are going to be under 4. And remember what I said earlier about the inflammation? Look how much inflammation she has. Mm -hmm. She's got a lot. So, oh, this would be fun for you guys that are into the hormone stuff. This is her cortisol profile. Um, oh, yeah. Should be a nice descending curve. That's fun to deal with, right? Mm -hmm. And she's got positive glycemic markers, so she's gluten sensitive. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll tell you something that I do with patients sometimes, <coughs> and this is almost a psychological thing to get by if somebody's really into, you know, their carbohydrates. They don't really. They have a, you know, that mental association with them. They don't really want to let them go. If you do. The right testing on these glade markers on some of these um, different gluten oriented things you'll find it pop up with most patients if you order the right testing for it so sometimes what i'll do with that is i'll order with the patient to get them to see it's not strictly about just the glucose insulin impact that those carbohydrates are having it's also about the immunological activity this is having as well i've got a study that I've been beating to death lately, but it's so profound in its findings. And what it said is that for individuals who are consuming 
acellular versus cellular. And the only difference that, I'd never seen it termed that way in a study, but basically what that boiled down to was cellular foods are living foods. So your meats, your plants, your vegetables, fruit, that type of thing, right? No, that's it. Your acellular foods are going to be your grains, more or less is what it comes down to. I mean, think about it. You lay a grain out on your kitchen counter and let it sit there for a month and come back. It's probably going to look pretty close to about what it did when you left it. You do the same thing with these other foods that I mentioned, and they're going to be putrefied, rancid, and have only knows what growing on them, right? Mm -hmm. So what they determined in this is that when you consume those acellular foods, the impact that that has on the microbiota in the gut is very negative. What it does is these harmful microorganisms that we pick up with like the Metametrics GI effects test and things like that, you're actually amplifying the growth of those microbiota. When you consume the cellular foods, you're having the exact opposite effect. The beneficial, your lactobacillus, your acidophilus species, you're actually improving the growth of those, not by supplementation, just by the food choices that you make. Okay? That's pretty profound. And what they actually showed as a result of that in that particular study was that the inflammatory cascade that comes along secondary to that harmful microbiota growth is a primary factor in the increase or in uh, leptin resistance and the increase in obesity. Right? Completely independent of anything glucose and insulin related. Completely independent. What's that say? If you guys want it, just let me know and I'll send it to you. Or, I got your email, I can send it out to everybody. It's a pretty new study, but here's what my intervention with her was. So, again, the metabolic support formula, so that's the metabolic synergy, the threes and the D. And again, these are pretty common interventions with these types of patients. But she had a lot of inflammation occurring, right? So I wanted to target that inflammation. So I came in with a plant-based antioxidant formulation. Now, why did I do plant-based as opposed to a nutrient-based? Are you guys familiar with the antioxidant pool where one nutrient-based antioxidant has the ability to resynthesize re another and they kind of play on each other? I'll give you an example. If you supplement someone who has a vitamin E deficiency and you only push vitamin E and you don't pay attention to selenium, you're going to draw the selenium deficiency and you'll end up correcting the E, but now you got a selenium deficiency to deal with, right? So you always have to compensate. When you're using plant-based antioxidants, you don't have to do that. The plant-based antioxidants take into consideration what that total antioxidant pool is, and they take the burden off of the total pool to allow the total pool to come up. So you're better off using your broad spectrum plant-based antioxidants, and they're more than likely gonna hit far more inflammatory mechanisms than just trying to use a, a nutrient or a combination of nutrients is gonna use. That Spectrox marker, I used to have a rough time trying to get that thing to come up with patients and keep it up. Since I started using this approach, I don't really have much issue getting that up anymore. So use your plant-based antioxidants there. You'll have better clinical success on this. And again, what was one of her primary sources of inflammation? Her gut. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to go in and I wanted to repair the damage that had occurred in her gut. So we used glutamine, some mucilaginous botanicals, things like that. Paleo diet took all the grains out and resistance training for short duration. She's fatigued, so we don't want to do long duration activity. We don't want to impact her cortisol. We want to do things that are more anabolic in nature, things that are going to give us better insulin receptor sensitivity. So that was the, the approach we used. And then last case study here. 11 year old female, 4'11", 20% body fat. So she's got good anthropometric measurements, right? Nothing wrong with any of that stuff. Severe eczema and asthma, okay, that's the main complaint. but had mortal courses of steroids, lethargic in the morning, just kind of a typical kid in the morning, right? Nothing, not really dragging out of bed per se, but you know, just typical. And no change in energy after eating. The one thing that I listened to her when I was taking her dietary history, consuming more carbohydrates than ideal, but nothing excessive when you look at it across the entire spectrum of the day. But in the morning, she had waffles fairly often, and she had syrup on it, right? Okay, right, you gotta do it, do it right, right? So, but I mean, if you look at that from a strictly blood sugar management of dysglycemia perspective, there's not a lot of, problem. you wouldn't think, okay, she doesn't have a lot of symptoms popping up. Look at this. Look at those efficiencies. Right? That's page one. Yeah. Right? So, you flip to her, what is that, three more pages? This is what it looks like. Oh my God. Right? 
a lot of res. A lot of, I mean, she's got a lot going on. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you break these down, you know, you can see the general pattern popping up. She's got the DNA for the B5, so we know we got these cortisone mechanisms in play with her. Mm -hmm. And think about it, you know, for her, you're definitely considering that because of the history of the steroid use. Um, you got the serine levels popping up. Uh, your vitamin D and calcium, so she already had an intracellular vitamin D deficiency here to justify this calcium, the intracellular calcium. The zinc's marginal, the fructose sensitivity. What's, what's causing that? That's serious, right? Yeah. That's what's causing that. And then, yeah, and actually Vinny just said no protein in the morning. Look at this, her carnitine. What are your predominant amino acids? Low. So we know that the ratio, uh, her macronutrient ratio between those fats, those proteins and carbs needs to be balanced out a little bit better. Right? You can see it. You can, you can identify how to follow through on manipulating someone's diet just based on what you're seeing in these micronutrient profiles. Um, yeah, her lipoic acid showed up. But again, look at what her insulin is here. 8.1. All three of these case studies have had insulins under 10, right? But it's a player, it's not under four. And you'll notice a similar type of <laughs> protocol with her, the D, the omegas. I mean, it works, guys. And you see now why it works, why you gotta do that. Um, and then same thing with her, she had an autoimmune presentation, gotta get her off her grains. Now, in summary, here's what I want you to think about as you are looking at these tests now. You gotta look at these tests. When you guys are seeing these tests, I don't want you just to look at the test and go, okay, there's my nutrient deficiency, let me just replete these. Go beyond that. Look at them and think, what is the pattern, what is the state of dysfunction that would lead to the pattern that this patient is presenting with? And it may be more than one, but this is one of the more common ones that you're gonna see. Look for the subtle shifts in your traditional glucose markers, the ones we talked about. Use, a, use tighter ranges. See things that are predictive in nature. Remember, this is a continuum. By the time they've got to 126, they're diabetic now. Could we have done something beforehand? Absolutely. Identify nutrient patterns, and again, we just talked about that. Remember the concept of biochemical individuality. Case one, terrible symptomatic presentation, hardly anything on the nutrient. Case three, had relatively no symptoms, terrible presentation on the, on the testing, right? Patients aren't textbook, right? They're not gonna present textbooks. Use the information that you have to follow through for them, right? Does anybody have any questions? How'd they turn out? <laughs> the, the best one that I've had so far is that last one. She actually, I've only been seeing her for two months now, and she was severe eczema. And I saw her father for the first time the other day. I just happened to cross paths with him at the front desk. And he looked at me and he said, I thank you so much for what you're doing for my daughter. I mean, think about it, guys. An 11-year-old female, you know, I mean, she's so intelligent. She's athletic. But an 11-year-old female with eczema, all this here theme of this dark red skin all the time, that's gonna be so embarrassing for her. And now the only place that she has it in a month is in the skin folds, in the in the axle awesome. area, mm -hmm. in the gluteal fold region. That's the only place she has it now. So. I have a question um, on the vitamin D, when you were talking about or calcium, low calcium presentation, you would anticipate seeing low D. I just had a recent one, and I've seen this a couple of times where you've got a borderline or low calcium and seeing great vitamin D. Are we just seeing something maybe that hasn't played out yet? Are, are you seeing the vitamin D on the intracellular panels? Yeah. Is that what you're talking about? Uh -huh. um, yeah. Um, really where you want to go with that is you got to differentiate between intracellular and serum on this. Mm -hmm. And if you follow the serum markers, unfortunately vitamin D is probably the only exception to the general pattern of how we look at this test. The serum vitamin D it's not that it's a better marker, it's, it, it's the marker that we have the most research on. So we know how to manipulate vitamin D levels based on serum markers, not on intracellular markers. So. On alpha lipoic acid, um, when do you decide, because your metabolic formula has what, 600? Yes. So when do you decide that you have to go above and beyond that, and then how high do you go in your patients with neuropathy, and? Are we only talking about diabetic neuropathies or what about peripheral neuropathies like TOS and carpal tunnel and stuff like that? You're mostly in this scenario talking about diabetic neuropathies because the mechanism of injury is different, right? 
So you've, you've, you've got the inflammatory impact in the diabetic presentation, you've got more an inclusive impact in your, like your TOS, stuff like that. So it's a little bit different mechanism of action there. Does that make sense? It, it does, but my, the way my redneck brain always did it was that <laughs> B12 and, and I, brain, I, that's why we get along so good. B12 yeah. and alpha lipoic acid are, are integral to the to the myelin sheath in a patient with TOS. Is there not a potential compromise to the myelin sheath? And and I've had a couple that responded. Now whether it was the treat the soft tissue treatment or I don't know, uh, but you know, I, my, my big question was how high do you get? I don't typically go above 600 just for a general presentation in a disc glycemic state. Now, if I can go to the point of defining it as truly diabetes, and especially if they've got some type of peripheral neuropathy playing along with that, then in that case, I'm going to definitely try to get to 1,200. Okay. And if 1,200 doesn't get it done, go higher. But that's my first 2,400. Okay. Most of those studies that were done on those dosages were using a racemic mixture. So they were using both the R and the L forms. If you just isolate the R form of lipoic acid, you can use a lower dose and get the same response. It's about half. You get about twice the benefit from the straight R stabilized form okay. of lipoic and, acid. And then the stupid question is that what I have on my shelf? If it's designed for health? I don't know. It's 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 not in every product. The metabolic not the, the straight mixture. Alpha lipoic acid. That's racemic. Okay, cool. I just I never looked at it. Mm -hmm. Is the digestive support that you put the that last patient on? What's that? What 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 kind of digestive support did you put that last patient on? Oh, it was um. It was just your uh, the digestive product. Digestive. So it's gonna have, yeah, it's gonna have mm -hmm. um. You know, your bile, your hydrochloric acid, your um, mm -hmm. pancreatic enzymes. Okay. If you got a patient that's real sensitive like that, I mean, mm -hmm. this this girl didn't really have any gut symptomatology, but if you got someone that is, you can put them on plant digestive enzymes mm -hmm. just to give them a little bit easier approach. Those people may not handle hydrochloric acid real well, mm -hmm. so you just have to play with it.